Leftovers from yesterday, if y'all want to eat. So, Ryan gets me the. What are these? Do they make the hybrids? What? Do they make the hybrids? I don't know. Yeah, I can't get anything. You might want to split that. Yeah, yeah. Alright. Or the bag. I like that shirt. Thank you. Yeah. Is that just for cheerleaders? Yes. <laughs> so you couldn't you couldn't scrounge one up in a large or a pack of every bottle. Hey, we're ordering. I really will order one. Yeah, yeah I want one. Why is that blue? It's probably rich, kind of blue. Hey, Taylor, will you bring me one? Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Dr. Warren.
Uh, just a really brief word about um, upcoming things on campus. Um, keep you keep these things in front of you. On October the 10th and 11th, there will be a, um, a bioethics conference on campus. It's co-sponsored by the Christian Studies and Biology faculty. And I'll be saying more about that to get closer to it. So that's going to be a Monday and a Tuesday. This class meeting on that Monday will actually we'll meet together with the freshman group that Dr. Boyce has to hear one of the speakers, Dr. Doug Axe, who's just come out with a brand new book called Undeniable. I, um, I've read it and uh, I'm very excited about him being here and guys getting to meet him. Second thing is um, November the 9th to the 12th. There is a Global Medical Missions Conference being held in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, I received some really good news yesterday. And we'll fill you out some of the details to come. Um, but um, even if you guys are not involved with the Pre-Med Honor Society, who will be sponsoring the trip, I know that many of you are interested um, in the medical field at various um, levels, and I want to encourage you uh, to consider going on the trip. The cost, as it turns out, is going to be very minimal for you. It's like, um, it's like we've had some folks step up, volunteer, travel. So there will be a professional bus service, Spangler Tours, and a professional driver to take you guys. And uh, I want to encourage any of you who are interested in going. I think the seating will be limited to about 30 students. So uh, you want to get with Kaylee Morgan, tell her you're interested sooner than later. She doesn't know this information yet. So you'll surprise her today when you mention that to her. So we'll just keep those things in front of you as uh, time progresses. Uh, if any of you are up early tomorrow morning, uh, Dr. Jones and I will be guest on Jambalaya, local uh, television talk um, program. I don't know who watches television at 6 o'clock in the morning. But, uh, a bunch of old people be watching us talk about the bioethics conference. So, um, things to look forward to on campus regarding the sciences. So spread the word to your friends and neighbors. You got you're going so, to Kentucky, Kentucky right? Sorry? Are you going to Kentucky? Uh, no, I have to be in Baton Rouge during those days um, to meet with the Louisiana Science Standards Committee, so I will not be on the trip. But there will be at least one, probably two faculty members who will be accompanying me on the trip. Okay, so uh, I always look forward to this time of the year. We've uh, we finished all our introductory things and we can start actually learning anatomy. I know that sounds um, a bit disappointing to you. You think, well, I've already learned a lot of that. Okay, well, no, you haven't. So um, off we go into anatomy. We start with the head. I always start with the fetal skull here. We'll talk a little bit about the differences in anatomy of the fetal skull versus the adult. Um, it also helps introduce uh, the major bones of the cranial vault and the connections between them. Now, you know already that the skull bones and the scapulars are made by intramembranous ossification, which means you don't expect to see hyaline cartilage here, and you don't. <coughs> Instead, what you see is the remnants of this intramembranous ossification process here, a dense piece of connective tissue. It's soft. It's not bone. And what happens during development, even very late um, in fetal development, and then even into the first couple of years of childhood, the skull bones have not completed their sutural joints. And so there are soft unions between the major bones of the cranial ball. And at the junctions, uh, at the corners, if you will, of each of these bones is a, a widened section of the fontanelle, a widened section of that membrane called the fontanelle. The name really came from the idea that you can feel pulse there. The imagination is there's a fountain somehow coming off of this spot. Um, so, they're named for their positions, and we'll learn them very briefly in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to talk about the importance of these things. Everyone knows um, who has been in the hospital and looked in the newborn area why fontanelles and these fibrous, soft connections between the skull bone are necessary. Everybody knows this. 
you look at a vaginally born child, you can tell the difference in their head and the head of a child born by cesarean section. The child who passes through the vaginal canal has to have a head that becomes no more than 10 centimeters in diameter. And so these soft places allow the skull to actually reshape. And if you look at the heads of these babies in the nursery who've just been born, their heads are cone-shaped because of this. It allows the head to be molded into a shape for the child to be born. Now, on the back, on the back side of this, after they're born, these soft places do not finish their ossification for up to two and sometimes longer than that, 24 months out to um, even 30 months um, for some youngsters, for these soft places to finish their ossification. And that's a really important observation for brain development because during the first three years of a human's life, the brain grows in size more than at any other time during their lifetime. And so these soft places allow for stretching, if you will, of the skull. The cranial vault is pliable to allow for the massive amount of brain growth that's occurring during these first two or three years. So what are their names? Um, so the first one we'll start with here, the, and we'll just connect them with the sutures. The first one is the anterior lateral fontanelle. When I sat where you're sitting, I learned that is the sphenoid fontanelle. Can you see why? Yeah, it's right next to the sphenoid bone. So if we work our way from the anterior lateral fontanelle posteriorly, we work our way along what will become a sutural joint between the parietal and temporal bones called the squamous suture. Now the reason that suture is called squamous should be clear to you. You know enough. Now, what does the word squamous mean? Flat. Flat. And that portion, the temporal bone, can be separated into several pieces. The petrous portion, the mastoid portion, the zygomatic arch portion, and the flat portion. The flat portion of this bone we call the squamous part of the temporal bone, and that's where that suture is. The flat suture, the squamous suture between the parietal and temporal bones. In the posterior aspect now of this suture is another widening, another fontanelle we call the posterior lateral fontanelle. I learned that one is the mastoid fontanelle. You see why? Can we change these names? Because the mastoid process here is the inferior extension off of there. So if you want to locate, that's an important anatomical landmark, the mastoid process. Later in your lives, you'll learn about a hearing bone conduction test called the Rhine test for bone conduction. And it's done by using a tuning fork pressed against the mastoid process. So the mastoid fontanelle here, or the posterior lateral, the sphenoid fontanelle here, or the anterior lateral fontanelle is joined by the squamous suture. Now if we turn, now and go superiorly along the border between the parietal and occipital, we find another uh, suture, what will become a suture, called the lambdoid suture. Because it looks like a Greek letter called lambda, yeah, the lambdoid suture, that's where it gets its name. And so the posterior lateral fontanelle then joins, the posterior lateral then joins the posterior fontanelle, which is at the junction here of the parietal and temporal bones. Now from the posterior fontanelle, we can work our way um, towards the frontal bone, separating the two parietal bones by way of a sagittal suture. Why? Why is it called sagittal? That is the body plane. Exactly. So that would be a sagittal body plane there separating the left from the right, the left parietal from the right parietal. And at the front here, the anterior fontanelle then is at the junction of the sagittal suture and the last one to learn for you guys, the coronal suture. Why? Why is it called coronal? It's in the body plane. If you didn't call it coronal, what word would you use? Frontal. Frontal separating the frontal bone from the parietal is the coronal suture. And right in the middle, it's the last fontanelle to finish ossification normally, the anterior fontanelle. And most people know about this one. Most people know you touch a baby's head, they have a soft place right here. But now what do you know also? How many other soft places are there? Six total. Six total. There are five others. Now the, the um, the other one that's really easy to find is the one just superior to the mastoid process. 
So just put your hand on the baby's mastoid process and work your way up a little bit, and you'll feel a little soft spot on their heads there. Okay. Now, um, the skull itself is made of 22 bones, as you know. Eight of them, eight of these bones are the bones of the cranial vault, and you don't realize it, but you just learned them. Eight of the bones are the casing for the brain. Can you name them? Start in the front. Frontal. Frontal. Parietal. Wait. Parietal. Right? Occipital. Occipital. Temporal. Sphenoid. Sphenoid. Now, why did I put two up? In each side. On either side. Good. Okay. So the cranial vault bones, and you know how they're joined, which means there are eight of those. So we have how many facial bones then? If there are 22 total, 22 minus 8. So there, there are facial bones that need to be pointed out. I am not going to go through and list them um, by way of uh, just boring you to death. I've had, I have them listed here. I'm going to say a few words about them as we go through this. Um, so let me just point out a few things here, and I'll repeat them as I go through um, the facial bones here. Um, and the skull bones. Let me tell you what I really want to do. At this point in your lives, I expect that you already know where these bones are. That is the idea. You're supposed to be taking the lab at this class. You're supposed to already know where they are. What we just did with the fetal skull is a good representation of that. You had no trouble bopping right through that with me. So what I'm going to do is after I just give a really brief, quick introduction of them, I'm going to back off here and start putting the body together. I'm going to back off and show you the face and the fascia and the connections and the muscles and the nerves and the blood vessels. Okay, so you learn the skeleton is the foundation of that. Okay, so the zygomatic bone is one of these facial bones. It forms part of the zygomatic arch. It's going to be, as we go through this, it's going to be part of the order of the eye, the lateral wall over the eye. It also is the cheekbone and it connects to the temporal bone by way of the temporal process and zygomatic. And it's going to be an important landmark for us for the temporalis here in just a minute. The zygomatic bone. The nasal bone is considered by textbooks to be part of the bony orbit of the eye. There is a, a little muscle named for this bone that wraps right over the inferior portion of it called the nasalis, and I'll show you that one in just a moment. But I never have really liked this description. I know I have to teach it to students, but sometimes when I point out to students that I don't like it, it helps them remember it. I don't like including it. All the books say the nasal is part of the orbit of the eye. So what we're saying is this piece right here is considered part of the medial wall of the orbit of the eye. The reason I bring that up here is because that's the most difficult part of the orbit. There are at least seven and you'll learn nine later in your lives, but there are at least seven bones that are the major bones that build the bony orbit. It's not just one bone around your eye. And so the bones in the medial wall are the most difficult, and they are in order. This will be a question on your next exam. Nasal, maxilla, lacrimal, ethmoid. There are four bones here that make the medial wall of the orbit, and you'll need to identify them anterior, posterior. We'll do this several times. Okay, so Nasal is part of the bony orbit. The lacrimal bone also is part of the bony orbit of the eye. It is named for a gland, which you will know much more about today. Today we're going to learn about the cranial nerve that innervates the lacrimal gland. It's coming today. So the facial nerve innervates a gland that sits right here in the superior lateral portion of the orbit called the lacrimal gland. It makes tears. And when you make tears, they come across the surface of your eye and they're drained We'll learn this when we get to the eyes, into two little holes called puncta that then drain down into the nasal cavity through the lacrimal bone. So the lacrimal bone is easy to identify because if you find it in the lab, you know it's the lacrimal bone because it has a hole in it. Tears have to get through there into the nasal cavity. So there's a little sac just inside the lacrimal bone called the nasal lacrimal sac. That empties into the nasal cavity. If you cry, some of that's coming out of your nose. And it's because of this lacrimal bone here uh, collecting the tears, or the tears passing through it from the gland that sits 
that sits up here in the superior lateral portion, so the orbit, lacrimal. The palatine bone is part, it's a, uh, a bone that we'll only mention a couple times. Um, I'm going to mention it to you as a connection of one of the pterygoid muscles, the medial. Um, whenever we talk about mastication, I probably won't get there today. Um, but for now, you know where the palatine bone is. It's part of the hard palate, right? So the upper jaw here is this hard portion inside your mouth. But that's not the only bone that's the hard bone, right? Because posterior to the maxilla is the palatine bone. Hence the name, the hard palate. So um, it's the, really the hard maxilla is what that is. And the, the palatine is just the posterior portions of that. So we're going to learn it in two contexts. One, it's the roof of your mouth. The other one, it's attached to a muscle of mastication. So that would be the palatine. The vomer is part of the bony nasal septum, the interior, uh, the, the, the central separation between the left and right nasal cavities is actually bony. And the top part of that, which we will beat to death, um, is the ethmoid, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, the bottom part is the vomer. That septum, many of you labeled it on your exam, I think Rebecca meant to label the inferior nasal concha, but the tape moved, and some of you called it the vomer, and everybody got credit for that on your lab exam. That is um, not your fault. You knew those bones. That's a test maker's problem. The vomer there is part of that bony nasal septum, and then you can see the inferior nasal concha, which I think uh, many of you put on your exam. So wherever, you, wherever that tape was when you showed it for the test, that's that's the answer that you put, and I don't think anybody missed. You either got vomer or inferior nasal concha there. Now, having mentioned that, let's talk about the concha momentarily. These are bony projections that stick out from the lateral walls. They stick out from the lateral walls into your nasal cavity. Your nasal cavity is not just a big opening. If you look in the mirror at home into your nose, you cannot see these because most of us have a mucous membrane that sort of uh, encases uh, right about at this level the opening. And you can see that little hip, uh, encasing. The mucous membrane actually comes slightly medial there. And you can't see behind it where these concha actually protrude into the nasal cavity. When you breathe, as the air moves through your nasal cavity, it doesn't just move through an opening, through one large opening. Instead, the air is channeled into channels below the inferior nasal concha, between the inferior and middle, and between the middle and superior nasal concha. There are three channels of air that flow through your nose. It forces the air that we breathe to be in closer contact with the mucous membranes in our nose that are wet, and moist and warm. And if you want to see what the value of this is, um, on a very, very cold winter day, go outside and take a deep breath through your mouth. That doesn't feel pleasant. You breathe through your nose, that feels more pleasant. Right? The idea here is to warm and moisten and humidify the air so that it is more pleasant and more amenable to gas exchange whenever we're breathing. These bones are called the turbinate bones. A turbine is something that turns. The concha bones are called turbinate bones because if the air passes through the channels, it tends to, because it's channeled, it tends to hit the back of the pharynx and roll. And so the rolling of that air as it passes through these channels actually causes it to stay in your nose longer. It is designed that way to help you um, with respiration. So they're important bones that stick out from the lateral walls, the inferior, middle, and superior nasal concha. Now the inferior is listed as a facial bone. Notice that I do not have middle and superior listed there. And the reason for that is the middle and superior nasal concha are actually part of the ethmoid bone. So that's a tricky little bone there. You can see the middle here, the middle nasal concha of the ethmoid you can see the ethmoid label here is part of the orbit of the eye. And when we open up the skull, what are we going to find? The ethmoid also has pieces that stick up into the cranial vault. 
one called the Cristigalli and the plate beside it, the cribriform plate. You know, seeing the value of having learned the skeleton. Okay, so that's a tricky little bone there, the ethmoid, and uh, we will talk about it more. All right, now let's start with the frontal and work our way around. I'm about to back off here and start teaching you some real anatomy. The frontal bone is relatively simple. Um, it connects with the parietals by way of the coronal suture, and it has a margin. There's, no, there's a notch that's normally labeled here, um, not labeled on this picture, but I do want you to be aware of the superorbital foramen, about that circle here. And so the superorbital foramen is the place where the superorbital artery, vein, and nerve comes out of the cranial ball. And I want to teach you a little bit more about that because I want to say something else that will help you for the rest of your lives. I start with the superorbital foramen. It's easy to remember. It's a hole in the frontal bone. I start with the superorbital foramen because there's blood vessels and nerves that go through it. And so this gives me an opportunity to say some fundamental things about blood supply. The first place you see it is the first hole we learned in the skull, and we'll see it many, many times in this class. So the superorbital foramen is the exit point for the superorbital artery. All right, now notice also before we leave it, the frontal bone is part of the bony wall of the orbit, and we'll also point this out as we go through. There's also a sinus here in the frontal bone. Now this will be something that we'll have to learn when we get to the respiratory system in detail. If you go into a person's nose, the two. There are four bones of your skull that you can actually get into from the nose. Bones that have holes or cavities in them that are continuous with the nasal cavity, and we call them sinuses. Most people know about this one because if you have a sinus infection and you tap here on the frontal bone, it's uncomfortable because that infectious material tends to accumulate in that bone. Where's the other place that's sensitive? Yeah. You tap here because the maxilla, that's the largest one. And as we proceed through and we get deeper in the skull, I'll show you the other two. Can y'all tell me the other two bones that have sinuses? The sphenoid has a sinus. And the ethmoid has multiple sinuses just behind the nose, right? So it's very interesting. Um, these sinuses are very popular these days because there's a relatively new procedure available now for people who have chronic sinus problems called sinuplasty or rhinoplasty, where knowledge of this has become very lucrative for ear, nose, and throat doctors. When I say lucrative, I mean 30 grand a procedure. Very lucrative. Um, so I had this conversation with Dr. Close, the allergy specialist in town. We are sitting on the bike, you know, at the health flex going nowhere together, um, chatting, and I said, now, uh, Dr. Close, did you get in on this sinuplasty thing? He said, way biggest day, did you get in on that? I said, I know, I got a friend who went over to Dr. Webb, and uh, he had his procedure done. He thinks Dr. Webb is, you know, God and then Dr. Webb, you know, because of the thing that happens in his life. He's always got the nasal sprays, he has his procedure, and life is transformed. They stick a tube through the nasal cavity into the sinuses, each one of these, and they blow that tube up and reshape the cavity. He said you could actually hear the bones going as he expanded the balloon inside the cavity. The beauty is on the back side of this, all the junk clears out, and then it stays clear. Apparently, indefinitely, and so um, you can take a tube, and knowing this, with a light on the end of it, and you can snake that tube down into the maxilla. Turn the lights off. I'm sure Dr. Webb's done this. Snake a, snake a light down in here. Turn all the lights off. Flip the light on. And there you are, right? Big light here. Snake a light up into the frontal bone up here. Turn the lights off. Just a beam right there. You can see it through the skull and the skin. You see the light glowing there. So. Um, the sinuses, frontal bone, we're doing frontal, back off now. Passing through the superorbital foramen is the superorbital artery nerve. Now, we're going to have to go here next, right? Because there's a muscle here. If I've torn the skin off and I can see the arteries and nerves and muscle, then we have to learn this muscle. And the beauty here is this was also easy. If it's on the frontal bone, I'm going to call it the frontalis. And it's supplied by this artery in part. And you see branches of it uh, passing up here on the skull. 
And you can also see branches of it turning here to connect with other superficial vessels. Now, back when I was a mean old person, I would take this picture here, the superorbital artery, and I would track it back down through the orbit and make the students connect it to the internal carotid artery. Because that's where it comes from. Now, I don't do that anymore, but I expect you to know that the blood in the superorbital artery came from the internal carotid. Because before we're done with this, you are going to have to get the internal carotid into the skull. It passes through a hole in the temporal bone. You know its name. The internal carotid passes through the temporal bone. You know its name. It's just in front of the jugular foramen. Named for the blood vessel that goes through it, it's called the carotid canal, right, the temporal bone, exactly. And so you can track this guy all the way back to that internal carotid, which allows me at this point, that allows me at this point to bring up another fundamental anatomy principle, and it's this. Blood vessels that supply places in the body tend to build multiple pathways for getting blood to those locations. <coughs> and normally, although this one is not a very good example of it, normally these places are places that are of extreme importance. The carotids just happen to be one of those places supplying the brain. So later, as we get to the bottom of the brain, you'll learn that there are in fact four different blood vessels that supply the brain, and they all connect to a circle on the bottom of the brain, and blood can come from anywhere on that circle to get into the brain. You say, well, Grandpa's got 90% blockage in his right internal carotid artery, you think, well, how is his brain surviving? And so we'll, keep, we'll keep doing this in different places. The heart is this way, the digestive system is this way. These are what we call anastomosing vessels. So I like to teach it as a fundamental principle right at the beginning of this. So you learn the superorbital artery supplies the frontalis. It comes through the frontal bone and supplies that muscle in the skin on the front of your head. The superorbital artery. Good. Okay. But it is connected to a blood vessel that comes up the side of the head called the superficial temporal artery. Now, you'll also have to learn this. So learn it now and learn it again. Just keep learning it over and over again. The superficial temporal is the last branch of the external carotid. So what I have just taught you is the end of the road. The superorbital artery is the end of the road for the internal carotid. And the superficial temporal is the end of the road for the external carotid. The internal carotids are really thought to be brain blood vessels, and the external carotids are thought to be skull blood vessels. But what we find here at the end of the story is the two join together. The superficial temporal artery joins branches of the supraorbital artery. It joins branches of the superorbital artery and becomes a single blood vessel. You don't just go out to the end of the superorbital artery and stop. That blood is continuous with the blood coming to the side of the head by way of the superficial temporal artery. Now, one more piece to finish this. The internal and external carotid arteries will become of extreme importance for us in the head. We're talking about the head. I introduced them to the students right off the bat. They, they diverge about two fingers down from the angle of the ramus of the mandible. See why it's so important to learn the skeleton? I can